All right. It's quite an honor for me to talk here. Okay, so in case of a familiar stimulus, <clears throat> an animal has generally learned from experience what behavior is appropriate. Um, but in case of a novel stimulus, the animal may need to generate different behavior compared to familiar stimulus. Therefore, the brain might, def uh, might benefit from a different representation for novel and familiar stimuli in the sensory pathway. Uh, this would allow downstream areas to execute different behavior depending on whether the stimulus is familiar or novel and potentially employ different forms of learning. So we wanted to say if these representations exist and um, use the primary visual cortex of the mouse as a canonical or prototypical sensory area. So what we did is uh, we placed a screen around in a awake mouse and uh, projected different images. And simultaneously, we imaged neural activity through a cranial window with a two photon microscope. We recorded from layer to three, and we have excitatory neurons that express GCAM6 fast, which is a calcium indicator. Um, we then record activity from, from about 100 neurons at the same time. At the case of a stimulus, we wanted to have uh, a set of images with the same statistic, but different detail, which drive uh, V1 neurons well. So we designed our images as a random <coughs> superposition of Gabor patches. We then formed a temporal sequence with those images. And then in order to create a familiarity, we took the sequence and repeated it many times. <coughs> which you can see here, um, abstracted as a staircase function where each level represents one image. Occasionally, then, we substituted one of the images with the novel image, which is drawn from the same distribution. So this is the kind of activity we get to a repeated sequence, which is essentially a weak stimulus locked activity. But on the other hand, if we show the novel image, um, the cell shows a comparatively large and transient response. And this is trial averaged here. But if you go to the individual trials, uh, we also see that the novelty response is present in most of the trials, which we can see here as a vertical band. So to quantify this effect in the population, we calculated the axis response, which is um, novel response minus sequence response. On the right side, we see the cells we recorded from, which is 1,100 um, 1, cells about uh, from five mice, which are ranked by the axis response here. And as you can appreciate, most of the cells have a detectable axis response. We estimate that we get, on average, about 0 0.5 extra spikes per cell. That might sound not as much, but it's a fourfold increase in activity to the repeated sequence. And overall, that would give an extra 100,000 spikes in V1 layer 2, 3 alone. So now we ask how many presentations are unnecessary to distinguish novel from familiar? At the beginning of the sequence, the images itself are novel, but after a while, the cell should pick up on the regularity and be able to respond differently to the sequence images versus the novel image. So we generated a sequence of images and displayed the predefined numbers of, uh, displayed it for the predefined number of repetition. And then we used a different sequence and displayed it for a different amount of repetition, so this is randomized, and we do this many, many times. And this is what we roughly get for an average cell. This is averaged over 80 trials. We get initially a, fir uh, a strong response, um, which adapts to near, near zero baseline in about a few seconds. And here you see the novel, uh, the response to the novel image, which is what I talked before. And the amplitude is about the same as you get for the initial response, which you can imagine that it should be, because at this point, it's essentially a novel response. It's a lot of novelty responses piled on top of each other. 
So when we then decrease the numbers of repeats, we can go all the way to two repeats, which is the minimum you need in order to call something familiar. And even there, we uh, get a detectable novelty response, so the adaptation is surprisingly fast. So how many different images can a neuron adapt to? For that, we show blocks of sequences with different numbers of frames. And also here, we pick every time a different sequence. Um, we go all the way up to 12 images. And what we found is that after a few repeats, the activity decreased similarly, as you can see here, uh, for 12 images as for three images. So that shows that the neuron can adapt to quite a lot of images, and we haven't tested the limits of that yet. If you plot the sequence length against the decay constant of the exponential, uh, you see a nice linear relationship, and that implies that the dynamics of the adaptation is invariant to the number of sequence repetitions. That means it takes about the same number of presentations for an image um, to get adaptation independent of the sequence length. Okay. So next we ask what feature of the stimulus elicits a novelty response. In particular, we're interested, is it some global uh, novelty response or something local? To answer this question, we did reverse correlation on the novel images of the repeated sequence. And in particular, we used the stimulus energy, which, is, um, which we define as the absolute value of the stimulus minus uh, the background. What we find is that we get localized hotspots for those cells which have approximately the size of receptive fields of a V1 cell, um, which is around 15 to 20 degrees. This means that the novelty response actually comes from a local area in visual space and is not um, a global perception of novelty. So now what does the population code look like? On the left, we see a plot that shows the activity of all the cells that we recorded in one session. And we start here with a novel sequence. And as you can see, you get this initial transient response, which we talked about, that is uh, distributed across a lot of cells, which then dies off after a few repeats. In addition, we get one cell here that um, does not adapt and continues with stimulus-locked activity. If you switch to a different sequence, we get the similar picture. We get, again, a large subpopulation of the transient active cells. And furthermore, a different cell which shows um, no adaptation and continued stimulus-locked activity. So ultimately, we have two types of responses, a transient and a sustained response. And we think of those as response types and not of cell types, because the idea is this cell here, which is sustained in that sequence, becomes transient here. And that cell, which is sustained for this sequence, can become transient here. So to wrap up the talk, we arrive at the following picture. We have a multiplex two-channel code. First, the dense transient code, and second, the sparse sustained code. Uh, the dense code represents the novel stimulus, and the overall increase in spikes can potentially act as an alert signal for uh, novel events. In addition, we did a decoding analysis that shows that the dense code actually con contains information about the identity of the stimulus, because the specific set of cells that are active changes depending on the stimulus which you can see here as a kind of different barcode pattern for these transient cells. The sparse sustained code, on the other hand, is a efficient continued representation of the identity of the stimulus. So now in the cortical theory literature, it's a long-standing idea that Cortical, um, and cortical area tries to predict the incoming stimulus and send only the surprising information up the cortical hierarchy, predictive coding. 
So the novelty uh, response that we observe um, seems to be similar to that. But what's different in our data is that we also have a channel representing familiar stimuli. A theory by David Heger, a uh, recent theory, is an alternative that suggests that uh, predicted information should be fed up the sensory hierarchy instead of surprising information. What we find in our data um, that layer to three neurons, which are the output of V1, represent both of these features with two different modes of the population code. So we think that our data reconciles different types of theories of predictive coding. Regarding the work, I would like to thank um, Sue Ann, who is my lab mate and provided her um, mice and worked out the area mapping, the visual area mapping for them. And Alistair, who is a former undergrad who did additional behavior experiments that I didn't have time to show. And um, of course, my advisors, David Tank and Michael Berry. And the results are currently available as a paper on the bioarchive. We have time for a couple of questions. Hi. Very interesting talk, thanks. Um, I might have just missed something in your experimental design, but it seems to me that there is two notions of novelty that are being at play at the same time here, and I'm wondering whether you uh, try to kind of distinguish between them. So one of them is that since you are always presenting things in the same sequence, you're stimulating the same sequence, there might be a novelty just because the wrong kind of stimulus arrives at the wrong position, or it might be that the sequence is irrelevant and it's really just the distribution of stimuli uh, that is being adapted to and um, the sequence aspect is not important. But if I, get, if I got it right, this particular experimental design doesn't quite allow you to uh, distinguish between the two. So I'm wondering whether you try to look at that and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so we tried the same <clears throat> with the random order of these stimuli and it does look pretty much the same. Um, I guess if you have a repeated sequence, you make sure that they can really add uh, constant intervals. Um, we are recording also from exercise errors right now, and it seems to be that some exercise errors actually show this kind of order dependence. So if you would ju just switch the order between two frames, mm -hmm. you would also get like a novelty response. Okay. Potentially A or AM. Hi, over here. Uh, this, the data is really interesting, um, and for me, looking at the, the data, I'm not a mouse, so I have a v different visual cortex, uh, but it seems that distinguishing uh, these types of superimposed random gabors would be kind of difficult. Uh, so do you think the mice could uh, learn to report the novelty? And have you, have you done that, and have you thought about doing this in, in humans, too, just to uh, compare? And then also, what do you think the limits are? Uh, could you do this with uh, repeated frozen white noise, for example? Can we move this over here? Oh, yeah, this is what the stimulus looks like approximately. And it's pretty difficult for humans which are not trained to actually see a, a novelty frame. But we did train mice and were able to get them to detect the uh, novelty frame, actually. And that's also in the paper. That, so we try to train them as simple as possible, which means that they have to lick on the water port, and right at that time comes a water droplet out, but they only, only if they lick when they see a novel frame. And they could actually learn that pretty fast. So here is a histogram of the times when the mouse licks. It has a certain set of exploratory licking. You can't really suppress that. I tried a lot of stuff to try to suppress that completely, and you can't. Um, but this peak here shows that the mouse predominantly licks at the novel frame. Thanks. Jan, if I may ask, um, what, what sort of metric for similarity do you expect to um, give rise to this novel response? Meaning, do you think that there are clusters of images that you could put together 
that would not elicit the novel, res novel response across the population as a whole. You, shows, you showed some nice results for single cells, but what do you, what do you think the um, strongest signal for population novelty might be, or is there, do you think it would be a smooth or a discrete jump? I guess as you as you change the similarity in the new image uh, that you present, I think it's probably a smooth transition. Uh -huh. And locally, the images which we show is are very different from each other. Right. And the receptive right. fields of these cells, you know, they pick up something local at that point. So if you would maybe just <coughs> shift the Gabors a little bit to the left or to the right, you might not get such a strong response. <coughs> I don't think it's some kind of signal that it's just an alert signal which gets uh, generated in higher areas. Mm -hmm. And actually we have something interesting here. <laughs> we checked the pupil diameter at the time of the novelty response and also for potential saccades and there is no excess um, change in pupil diameter. So that means essentially that frame is kind of ignored by the mouse and doesn't really cause a, um, a change in arousal. That's interesting, Th these are all very, These are all passive experiments, so the mice were not trained or anything and they didn't have to do anything. One more question. Thanks, a uh, very good talk. I wonder whether you can Thank decode the identity of the stimuli through the responses of the neurons and whether this kind of decodability, if, if there is any, disappears after saturating to the familiar sequences. Sorry, what disappears? Uh, the decoding ability. Like, I wonder whether you can decode the identity of the images from the responses of the neurons. Yeah, we can. This is what I showed in the last slide. We did a decoding analysis. And what we get here is extra information about the stimulus. So this dense code, I mean, is, um, by the fact that it's dense, can contain a lot of information, right? OK. So, we, so you can decode the identity of yeah. the uh, stimulus image, like in different frames. Yeah, so actually it turns out this is the discriminability, we showed 10 oh, different okay. types of sequences and at the beginning the discriminability is higher, so with 50% uh, probability we can tell what sequence was shown in that data. I see, okay, thanks. Okay, let's thank all the speakers.